All right. Yes. Okay, we can hear you. Excellent. Okay, uh, I'm Adam Nickel. I'm the team supervisor uh, for the Peshko Work Unit. So that covers the Green Bay office here, Peshko, and also up to Florence. So, um, Dave, do you want to? Sure. Uh, Dave Blairski, I'm the Eastern District Supervisor. So I cover Northeast Wisconsin. Jason. Uh, I'm Jason Bregman. I'm the fish biologist with the DNR based out of Green Bay. I have a, a more detailed intro as yeah. to open up my presentation. So, yeah. And then, well, I'm Mel Moore. I am a LTE fish technician at with Jason. All right. So, this is part of a, I guess we're calling it a spotlight series of um, somewhat to pet school work unit, Northeast Fisheries Management Area. So, uh, I hear. The uh, idea kind of came together to uh, host these public information meetings throughout the Northeast region, uh, really to give us an opportunity to talk to you about uh, what we do in our various offices uh, throughout the area. So uh, last week uh, we were up in Florence and we talked there about inland trout and lake management in Florence and Forest County. So uh, we were up in this region last Last week we had about 50 people online there and about 30 uh, in person and it looks like we're going to be well above that here tonight. So, so that's great. Uh, that's what we want. Um, we want to give you uh, information on what we're doing. Uh, as you can see on the screen, we've got a number of these more coming up. Uh, so the next one after Jason's is Northern Pike and Yellow Perch, uh, Green Bay Management, and you can see the rest of them here on the right. So. Uh, if you're interested in any of these topics or these areas, uh, same drill as how you got here today in person or on Zoom. So uh, feel free to sign up for those as well. Uh, so tonight, what you're here for, uh, tonight's gonna be kind of an overall view of Green Bay walleye and muskie management. Uh, Jason has been here as a senior fish biologist for a little over two years now. So uh, he's been working a lot with um, getting up to speed with management on, on Green Bay and uh, you're kind of here the history of management and also hopefully where we're headed uh, to continue uh, with with walleye and muskie management. So I'll turn it over to Jason. All right. Thank thanks you. Adam. Um, thanks everyone for showing up tonight. It's great to see this big of a crowd and welcome to everyone on Zoom. So um, I'm going to talk mostly about walleye and muskie management, some of the history, what we're doing now, and where um, where we're trying to take the management of both of these species. But since I'm relatively new and a new face or new voice to many people, I wanted to give a brief introduction about myself. Um, so I started my fisheries career almost 20 years ago um, at the University of Minnesota, where I got my Bachelor of Science degree. I didn't know what I wanted to do after I graduated, so I decided to uh, stay at the university for a year and a half, working as a research technician, helping out various graduate students, mostly doing lab work, estimating age and, and growth rates of fish. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with how we estimate age and growth rates, um, several bones on fish lay down rings, just like trees lay down rings, and you can count those rings to get how an age estimate for that fish. So that's a picture of an otolith on the right. Um, otolith are ear bones. Um, it's like humans have three bones in their ears that they use for balance. Fish have three bones in their ears that they use for balance. And we can pull those bones out and count the rings on it to get how old those fish are. Um, so uh, I really enjoyed the research side of things. So I decided to go to Stevens Point here in Wisconsin to get my master's degree. Um, and my research project there was comparing age and growth estimates from different bones. Um, for yellow perch in Green Bay, we were looking at scales, um, otoliths, and fin spines. That's a picture of a yellow perch fin spine with the rings in yellow. Um, and then looking at how the different age and growth estimates um, affected their statistical catch at age model that they used to set yellow perch harvest limits. 
I enjoyed research so much I decided to go and get my PhD at South Dakota State University. Um, my research was all down in Texas in a lake, um, researching the different factors affecting the growth potential of largemouth bass in that lake and putting together a management plan to maximize the growth potential in that lake. So we had radio tag largemouth bass that we were following um, daily and seasonal movements. We were using the latest uh, sonar technology to do habitat mapping and look at habitat use through using, doing seasonal diets and to see if we could manipulate prey in any way to enhance growth potential, um, et cetera. So after I finished my PhD, I did a, a short stint with the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, in Columbia, Missouri, designing and evaluating gears for capturing bighead and silver carp um, in the Illinois River. Those are the invasive jumping carp. Um, I did another short stint with the Fish and Wildlife Service out of Green Bay, um, working on their native fish program, uh, mostly doing lake trout monitoring and restoration work uh, before I finally settled with the DNR. Um, so I started with the DNR about seven years ago in March of 2017. And for the, the first five years, I was a biologist based out of Shawano covering Shawano, Opaca, and Menominee counties, everything in those counties outside of the Winnebago system. And about two years ago, I moved to the Green Bay office and I'm responsible for managing inland waters in Brown and Manitowoc County and walleyes and muskies on Green Bay. And so I've had the opportunity to work on a lot of cool research projects, um, opportunities. I, I put a lot of stock in research, so hopefully you'll see that coming through and how we're trying to manage some of these populations with partnering with research partners and things to get a better understanding of what's happening in such a large system. So, uh, moving on to the history of walleyes and muskies in Green Bay. Um, so looking back about 150 years ago at the late 19th century, early 20th century, there were abundant walleye populations throughout Green Bay. Um, <clears throat> there were documented spawning populations in all the four major tributaries that we see them today, the Ocano, Peshtigo, Menominee, and Fox Rivers. Um, and you look at some of the reports from some of the earlier settlers and they're um, we're subjecting these populations to pretty intense harvest, even back then. I mean, you'd read statements like one man could spear over a thousand pounds of walleyes in one night in one of these streams during the spawning season. But at the time, they were considered inexhaustible resources, so they just kept working on harvesting them. Muskies were also an abundant predator um, in the bay at the time. They weren't targeted as much as walleyes from a commercial standpoint, but they are a native species to Green Bay, a part of the, the near shore fish community and an, uh, an abundant predator. Um, so we're also subjecting, uh, starting to subject these populations to some other stressors aside from intense harvest. Um, one of those is habitat degradation. Um, right around the early uh, 1900s is when we started to lose a lot of our wetlands. Um, and these wetlands often served as critical spawning and nursery habitat for many of these species, including muskies. Uh, there was also quite a, a uh, significant declines in water quality as industries were showing up along the rivers and around the bay. Um, they oftentimes dump their waste right into um, the rivers or the bay itself. There wasn't much regulation with regards to water pollution at the time, and it was an easy, cheap way to dispose of all their waste. Um, we also are getting a lot of sediment inputs into our systems from um, increases in agriculture and runoff carrying uh, sediment into the streams. And then also, um, invasive species were being introduced at that time. Some of the big uh, players in the the Lake Michigan system being sea lampreys and rainbow snout. So abundant populations, but undergoing a lot of stress. Um, just some examples of habitat loss. Um, so this is a picture of the Fox River just below the De Pere Dam. Um, the De Pere Dam is at the bottom of this, um, the screen there. And this picture was taken in 1938. Um, and believe it or not, there were um, pretty high quality abundant wetlands throughout the Fox River um, right around the early 1900s. And by the 1970s, those wetlands were essentially gone. Um, and that's gonna play a critical role in things like spawning and nursery habitat for our muskies. Um, same story in Lower Green Bay. This is a picture from 1938 of Pete's Lake or the Duck Creek area. 
Um, and that's Duck Creek flowing into um, a large uh, delta that was mostly emergent wetland habitat, hundreds of acres of contiguous emergent habitat, and the Cat Islands were still um, around in the 30s, protecting that area from um, northern and northeastern wind surges. And um, so again, those are all hundreds of acres of high quality wetland habitat. And by the 70s, the Cat Islands were gone and all that wetland habitat is gone. So some pretty significant um, declines in habitat uh, due to human alterations and various other factors that played a role. So I took this plot from a paper that was published in 1979 by um, Schneider and Leach, and I think it shows a good depiction of the trends in the walleye population. And the, the whole premise of their paper was summarizing commercial fishermen catches throughout the Great Lakes from the late 1800s through the 1970s. And so we got the years on our x-axis and on the commercial harvest on the y-axis. And you know, between 1900 and 1920, it was the heyday of commercial fishing for walleyes out on Green Bay. There was a commercial fishery back in that day. Um, and uh, it was a highly successful commercial fishing, uh, fishery, but pretty abrupt decline starting right around um, 1920 to the point where they really couldn't catch many at all by the 1930s and 40s. Um, there was a small rebound in the 40s and 50s, but that was actually due to increases in spawning up in Michigan waters of Green Bay. Um, and there was an abundant walleye population in the northern part that at times would move down to southern Green Bay so they could actually catch some walleyes for a short time period in Wisconsin waters of Green Bay, but that also declined very quickly and only lasted five or so years. So by the 1970s, um, there was only, uh, a, the only place that we know of that there was a naturally reproducing walleye population left in Green Bay um, in Southern Green Bay, it was in the Menominee River, and it was a very small population. And to the best of our knowledge, muskies had been extirpated from the bay. So we took what were abundant populations and essentially crashed them. So, um, right around the 70s was also the time where we started to realize the impacts that we were having, and we worked to reverse some of those impacts. Um, and some of the big regulations that set the stage for potential restoration. Um, one of the bigger ones nationwide was the Clean Water Act that was enacted in 1972. And um, that was the first piece of legislation that really had teeth that regulated discharge, direct discharge of pollutants into our waters. So um, it allowed for pretty big improvements in water qualities. Um, some more local acts of legislation. Um, so Lower Green Bay and the Fox River in the 1980s was designated as an area of concern um, along with all the other areas of concern around the Great Lakes. And it was all these areas were designated through an international commission uh, made up of representatives from Canada and the United States. Um, and this particular area of concern was designated due to contaminated sediments, mostly PCBs from the uh, paper factories, poor water quality from other discharges um, and sediment, and also significant losses in altered or lost or altered habitats. And also, um, once it's designated as an area of concern, it has to have a remedial action plan. So a plan put in place to reverse those impacts um, and restore some of the lost habitat, improve water quality, um, et cetera. And then also in 1998, the EPA um, held all the parties that were responsible for, in particular, discharging pollutants into the uh, Fox River um, in Lower Green Bay. They held those parties responsible and forced them to clean that up, which was the dredging and capping that ended a couple of years ago. Um, so that, and as some of these things the stage for improvements in water quality um, and opportunities for habitat restoration. So, um, before I talk about the, the different species, just a, a little bit of background on the different gears that we use. I'll talk about the ways that we survey fish populations. Um, so at least I'll give a brief intro on the gears that we use. So for muskies, um, we use fife nets to capture adults. And this is a picture of a fife net um, under the water. Um, here and so imagine that the shoreline is on the left of your screen and we stretch these nets out perpendicular 
Um, and what looks like a fence we call a lead. It's got white floats on the top that hold the top of the lead up um, and weights that hold the bottom of the lead um, down on the bottom. So fish that are swimming along the shoreline encounter that lead, they can't go through the net. So they have to try to swim around it on the outside um, and they end up swimming into our large trap in the back. Um, so to help us keep fish in those spike nets, we have throats in them in various locations that act like funnels. They're wider in the front, narrower in the back, so fish can easily swim backwards towards the back of the net, but they can't as easily swim out towards the front of the net to escape, to get back out. So it's a picture of a throat inside one of the nets. Um, when we're going to lift fish out of these nets, we always remove fish from the back of the nets. We can pull our boat up to the back, untie the back of the net. Um, once we lift it on our boat, we use long-handled dip nets to scoop the fish out. So, um, The other gear that we commonly use to survey both walleyes and muskies is electrofishing. So for those of you that aren't familiar with electrofishing boats, it's a picture of one of our boats here. Um, all the boats have elect uh, generators in the back that produce electricity. It uh, goes into a box that um, is right in front of the driver's seat, so the driver controls all that electricity um, through that box. It goes through a series of cables and is put in the water out in the front of the boat through those electrodes. Um, and it stuns the fish, and then there's people standing up on the front of the boat with long-handled dip nets that can scoop up those fish. It's not designed to kill the fish, it's just designed to put enough electricity in the water to stun them so they can't swim away. And then all of our boats have live wells. You can't see it very easily in the picture, um, but there are large live wells that we keep water circulating through to keep the fish alive until we're done with our station. So um, just a little background as I talk about the management of these species for how the gears work. So start with a little bit about musky life history. Um, they typically spawn near uh, organic matter such as decaying leaves, branches, wood, things like that. Um, they will spawn in gravel habitat in particular in the Green Bay system um, as well as marshy habitat. Um, they spawn when water temps are typically 50 to 60 degrees um, and when females go to lay their eggs, sometimes they'll deposit their eggs over several hundred yards of shoreline. So they'll start releasing their eggs and just keep swimming down the shoreline, releasing their eggs um, as they swim along. So similar to musky or walleyes, they provide no parental guarding. Um, so they release their eggs and then they um, let mother nature take its course. They prefer cool water typically in a variety of habitats, especially in a large system like Green Bay, such as um, wood, vegetation, some reefs, as well as offshore open water areas. Um, as adults, they're typically predatory, so they key in on feeding on other fish species. They can start to mature or reproduce at about age five in the Green Bay system, and typically by about age eight, 100% of the the fish are mature or will start spawning. Um, and they can live to be 20 plus years old, just like the walleyes will. Um, and on Green Bay, at least, they can grow to be 55 plus inches long. So you don't typically see muskies that big in inland systems as often, but in the bay, um, you know, we typically handle a couple of fish bigger than 55 inches every spring and anglers will catch a few every year that are that big as well, so. Um, like I had mentioned uh, earlier, muskies were thought, or essentially thought to be extirpated from Green Bay. So starting in 1989, the DNR partnered with um, other uh, um, clubs in the area and around the state to uh, put together a three-phase um, reintroduction plan to restore the muskie fishery. Um, so the first step in that plan was to identify an appropriate egg source and begin to stock fish. Uh, the second uh, part of that reintroduction plan was to establish inland uh, brood stock lakes. So we would stock fish in these lakes when they're small, let them grow to, um, for five to ten years until they became adults. And then that would be our future brood stock for continuing our stocking program as necessary. And then the ultimate goal was to, uh, to develop a self-sustaining musky population in Green Bay. So one that doesn't rely on stocking, that natural reproduction um, sustains that fishery through time. So 
Um, the first phase, and we'll go through each of these phases where we're at um, as far as the restoration program goes. So the first phase was to obtain eggs, rear, and um, stock fish to begin to establish a population. So um, this is a plot that shows the number of muskies stocked um, in each year going back to 1989 when the reintroduction program began and the first fish were stocked. And so the blue bars are fingerlings. Um, those muskies are typically five to six months five to six months old, so they were hatched in the spring and then stocked out that same fall, typically when they're 10 to 12 inches long. And the orange bars are yearlings. So those fish are held over in hatcheries longer, um, over the, for a muskie it would be over the entire winter and they're stocked during their second summer of growth, typically when they're 13 to 15 months old. So when they're um, a much larger size. So um, we'll talk about some of the trends in a little bit, but just um, some figures. To date, we've stocked 187,000, over 187,000 fingerlings and 41,000 into the Green Bay system to establish that fishery. Um, and there's some of our partners in here that have helped with this restoration program, provided funds, um, continue to provide funds to help with our stocking, to get grants and things. So thank you in particular, Tidal Town and there's several folks from Tidal Town in here. So thank you for um, your help with the projects in particular, getting this stocking going. So, Wanted to talk a little bit about opportunities as well as challenges that we've experienced with our muskie stocking through time. So in the um, 1989 through 2001, um, stocking numbers were low and a lot of that was to find an egg source. We didn't have a source of Great Lakes spotted muskies in Wisconsin, so we were getting them from lakes in Michigan, Georgia Bay, some other areas. But eventually we were able to get enough um, adults established in the population, so in the early 2000s, we used the Fox River um, as our brood stock source. So we were able to get a lot more eggs and raise a lot more fish. So the first challenge was VHS. Um, that's why there really were no fish docked in 2007, 2008, or 2009 once VHS came. Long. For those of you that aren't familiar, VHS is viral hemorrhagic septicemia. It's a fish virus that causes significant mortality events in fish, and it's known, um, it's been documented in the Great Lakes and in the Winnebago system. Um, and so once VHS got established in the Great Lakes, we couldn't use um, source like the Fox River for brood stock anymore because we didn't want to bring VHS into our hatcheries. So. Um, starting in 2010, we were able to raise some fingerling muskies at the Sydney Anatomist Fish Facility um, in Kiwani. And so the ponds were raised on Kiwani River water, which is considered part of the Great Lakes system. So we were able to raise fish there, um, even though they were potentially exposed to VHS, but we couldn't raise a lot of fish at uh, Basedney just because of the small capacity, but it was the only place that we could raise a fish um, that would potentially from a VHS positive source. So starting in 2015, that's when we see this big um, increase in the yearlings that we stocked. So um, we started a program with Michigan in which the DNR would um, bring in small fingerlings from um, Michigan DNR, from fish that they spawned in Lake St. Clair, the Detroit River system, keep those fish in our hatchery for nearly a year and stock them out as yearlings. And we did this for two reasons. One was to um, increase the size of the fish that gets stocked um, since we're holding them in our hatcheries for longer, but also uh, we wanted to enhance the genetic diversity of our Green Bay muskie population. So the Detroit River Lake St. Clair um, system has a naturally reproducing, self-sustaining muskie fishery. We thought if we brought in some offspring from that population, it would potentially enhance the genetic diversity of our Green Bay population and increase the likelihood of uh, natural reproduction and survival. Um, so COVID had a little bit of an impact on our stocking. Um, so in 2020, we only stocked out yearlings. Those were fish that were brought into wild grows in 2019 already before COVID, but we did not spawn any muskies in the spring of 2020 due to COVID. So no fingerlings were stocked that year. 
Michigan did not spawn any muskies in 2020, so there were no yearlings available for stocking in 2020. So that's why there were only fingerlings stocked in that year. Um, there was a big increase in the number of fingerlings stocked in 2021. Um, our hatchery staff developed protocols to disinfect eggs from VHS waters, so that opened up the opportunity to um, raise muskies at facilities other than Besedni. And so starting in 2021, we've been um, raising fingerling muskies at both Besedni and Wild Rose State Fish Hatcheries, so that greatly increased our capacity for the number of fingerlings that we could produce. Um, we had a couple of hurdles in 2022. Um, first off, we had poor egg survival and hatching from the fingerlings that we spawned on the Fox River. Those are from adults um, that we spawn on the Fox River. And it was thought that rapid warm up at the time of peak spawning, we had three or four days of record highs in a row. Um, added extra stress and poor egg quality and we had really poor egg survival and then we had a fungal outbreak in um, the yearlings that resulted in higher than expected mortality in our particular yearlings and so we've tried to implement some changes um, for example this past year we spawned muskies earlier in the spawn before water temps on um, got um, as you know, kind of before the peak on the Fox River, and we also had plans to um, survey an area farther north, such as Surgeon Bay or the Menominee River, if we saw poor egg survival from those uh, fish that were spawned on the Fox River, go to an area further north and try to collect some brood stock later in the spring to get another source of eggs if needed. Um, and other places, Michigan, other states have also had some challenges with raising these fish with survival um, and things as well. And then in, in 2023, we actually had the highest number of yearlings that we've stocked in any given year um, get stocked out, but there was unfortunately a, a viral outbreak in the ponds um, that the fingerlings were being raised in and all the fingerlings that um, ended up getting euthanized. It didn't die from the viral outbreak because we didn't want to stock those fish out into the wild and potentially um, have a negative impacts on our wild system. Mm -hmm. So we've run into some challenges, but overall we stocked um, a lot of muskies and continue to um, stock muskies to um, provide a fishery as well as hopefully um, get a naturally reproducing uh, population going. So where have we stocked these fish? So the two largest stars that are orangish and brownish are the Menominee River as well as the Fox River. Um, and those are the areas that have received the vast majority of the muskies that have gotten stocked through time. The yellow stars are areas that we're currently stocking, but they receive a much lower number of fish. And then the green star in the bottom is University Bay area. And that was a historical stocking location that hasn't been stocked in about 20 years with fish. So those are the different areas that we've historically stocked fish or continuing to stock fish. Um, so, um, that's the, the stocking component of our restoration program. The phase two was to establish inland brood lakes. Um, and to do this, our goal was to stock young fish, fingerlings, or yearling muskies, allow those to grow to be um, adults, and then use that as our egg source um, when they're old enough to spawn. So our first attempt at an inland brood stock lake was Long Lake in Washera County, and we stocked muskies in there over a couple of years. Um, and shortly after we started stocking, the um, local residents and anglers raised concerns about the impacts that muskies might have on the rest of the fish community. Um, and so we stopped stocking Long Lake, um, and it was no longer in consideration as a brood <coughs> stock lake. In 2009, we set up three other lakes to be brood stock lakes, um, Anderson, Archibald, and Elkhart Lake, and we've been stocking them quite regularly. Um, since 2009 and we've surveyed all these lakes in recent years and have struggled to capture adult muskies and most of those waters especially enough to spawn so we're actually no longer using these three lakes as brood stock lakes anymore um, it's up to the local biologists they can continue to stock uh, muskies in them for um, fishery purposes but they won't be getting yearlings for brood stock lakes um, anymore so our plan is to use the Green Bay system itself as our broodstock source moving forward since hatchery staff
can disinfect the eggs to bring those in the hatchery and our primary brood stock source is the Fox River, but we um, may use other sources around the bay as well. So um, no longer using the inland lakes as brood stock lakes for this project. So phase three, the most important phase, creating a self-sustaining musky population and our ultimate goal with this particular fishery. So. Um, the vast majority of our fish that we've stocked have received fin clips the last couple of years. Um, we've missed out on a couple of clippings due to COVID um, and some other things, but um, the vast, vast, vast majority of our fish, especially historically, have all received fin clips. And 20% of the yearlings in most stocking events receive um, pit tags. So this gives us the uh, opportunity to evaluate contributions of stocked versus naturally reproduced muskies that we capture in our surveys. We can look for fin clips and tags and know was that fish stocked or was it potentially a naturally reproduced fish uh, based on these marks at the time of stocking. So, for those of you that aren't familiar with what PIT tags are, uh, PIT tags, PIT stands for Passive Integrated Transponder Tag. Um, I have a picture of a PIT tag circled in white in my hand there. Um, these are small little tags that are essentially the same thing as microchips that we're putting in our pets nowadays. Um, they're injected just under the skin of fish with a hollow needle. Um, and again, 20% of our stocked yearlings in most years, as well as all of our captured adults, um, receive these pit tags. And all these pit tags, each tag has its own unique identified a number, so we can essentially track individual fish based on these tag numbers. So we can look at things like growth rates, uh, movements, and spawning site fidelity um, using data from these pit tags. Um, so this is a picture of one of the um, wands that we use to scan for pit tags and fish. This is just one example. There's lots of different examples out there, but we carry these readers along with us when we're doing these surveys and we'll scan all the muskies that we capture in our surveys um, with one of these readers looking for the tags. Um, and we also have a stationary pit tag array out on the Peshtigo River. So this is a picture on the left is the array um, out of the water. Um, and what it essentially is is a series of different readers um, that as soon as a fish swims over it and the readers detect it, they'll log it into a computer on shoreline. So it's a stationary array that's working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but the fish have to swim over that array in order for the pit tag number to get logged. So, and I circled the array under the water um, there. It's hard to see in the picture, but it spans the entire width of the Peshtigo River um, just upstream from the city boat launch. So in the pit tag array was primarily installed for detecting sturgeon that also get pit tags, but we can get data from muskies from it as well. And there's other species that are pit tagged. So um, what surveys are we actually doing to um, look for adults and look for stocking contributions on things? Um, so we've been doing an annual spring fight netting survey on the Fox River for um, a long time. Um, you know, it's our brood stock source, um, as well as an opportunity to collect data from those fish. Um, so uh, as part of our fi uh, fight netting survey, we're collecting data on the size structure of our adult musky population, um, looking for recaptures and evaluating potential natural reproduction via fin clips and pit tags as well as using this as our brood stock for future stockings. So um, again, I don't have the 2023 data ready to roll, but in 2022, um, we set five nets on May 10th and we checked those nets on May 11th. Um, so those five nets fished for 24 hours and we caught 81 adult muskies between those five nets, which averages out to 16.2 muskies per 24 hour soak. That's an incredibly high catch rate for a muskie population. So pretty incredible that we can capture that many adult muskies um, in five nets in 24 hours. Um, this is a length frequency distribution that shows the size range of muskies um, that we captured in our spring fight netting survey. So the females are in blue, the males are in orange, 
Um, these are inch bins on the x-axis, the, the horizontal axis, so like on the far left, the, the 30 <coughs> bin, that would be the fish between 30 and 30.9 inches. Um, you know, so they're the uh, fish in one inch length bins, and the y-axis is the number caught. Um, so the males and the orange, we caught males that were anywhere from 35 up to nearly 50 inches, and they average about 44, 45 inches, and the females grow to be larger sizes. The mature females ranged anywhere from 40 up to 55 inches or so, so um, and they average about 50 inches. Um, so this is a plot showing the average length of males and females in our Fox River survey over the last 20 years or so. So the males are in orange and the females are in blue. Um, and early in the survey, um, sizes were a little bit smaller. Um, we had more younger fish in the population, but through time the average size has grown um, and increased. And right now the average size female that we capture is about 50 inches and the average size male is about 44 inches. And so pretty incredible size of the fish that we handle in our um, system. Um, the other surveys that we do that we um, are handling muskies is our fall electrofishing surveys. So we do a lot of surveys looking for fall young of the year walleyes. We're also capturing muskies in these surveys. Um, and electrofishing is a, an effective year at capturing young muskies, young of the year muskies, and um, even do degree juvenile muskies. So um, any small muskies that we encounter on fall electrofishing surveys, we will capture to look for fin clips and pit tags to try to evaluate um, any evidence of natural reproduction. Um, and then the last piece of data that we collect on our muskie fishery is our catch and harvest data, again from our creel survey program that I described for walleyes. So, um, this is our numbers of muskie caught um, over the last 20 or so years estimated from our creel survey. I don't have the harvest data in here because very few muskies get harvested um, in the bay itself, but um, in the early and mid 2000s, anglers were estimated to catch, you know, 1,000 to 2,500 muskies a year, and that's really increased over the last couple of years, where it's been more in the three to 4,000 fish range. So 2020 was a uh, likely an underrepresentation of the true number of muskies caught because our creel clerks were limited in that year due to COVID. But um, definitely seen an increase in the numbers of muskies that anglers are catching out on the bay. So I want to circle back to our restoration program and where we stand with regards to meeting our, our final goal of creating a self-sustaining muskie population. And like I, I mentioned, the vast, vast majority of our fish have received stocked fish and received fin clips over time, except um, one or two stockings over the last few years um, haven't. And again, 20% of our yearlings receive pit tags. So uh, because of this, um, we give our, our stock fish marks. What we've seen is that there's very limited amounts of data that are documented in the region. The vast majority of fish that we end up handling in our surveys are stock. Um, we have documented a little bit of natural reproduction in the Menominee River as well as the Sturgeon Bay area, but for the most part, stocking has been what sustained the fishery. So. Um, why, I guess, begs the big question that we're trying to understand. Um, to help us answer this question, we partnered with some researchers at the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point, and they had two graduate students that were working on musky spawning projects. Um, and those were Jared Krebs and Robert Chipper between 2017 and 2019. So, Part of their project was they captured adults and surgically implanted radio and acoustic transmitters in these so that they could track movements and identify potential spawning locations of those adults. Um, once they had potential spawning locations identified, they circled back um, during the spawning time period and did both egg and larval sampling at potential spawning sites. And most of this work was done in the Fox River and the Menominee River but they did do a little bit of work in Green Bay itself. But again, the vast majority of the work was in the Fox River and Menominee River where we stocked most of the fish. So they were able to identify the habitat variables that muskies were seeking out for depositing eggs. Um, not, not surprising, it was shallow water, 
shallow slopes, um, high dissolved oxygen near shore, and in gravel and organic matter substrates. So those were the factors that they were um, identified that muskies were actively seeking out for laying their eggs. So then they took mapping um, software and mapped all available habitat on the Fox River and Menominee River to see how much spawning habitat was actually available in these two systems, and it's not much. Um, so this is a picture on right was um, taken from mapping the nearshore habitat on the Fox River, but they estimated that just over 1% of the Fox River is suitable spawning habitat for muskies and better in the Menominee River, just over 8%. But um, the key take home message is there's very, very little spawning habitat on the Fox River. Um, they only captured two larval muskies throughout their three years of looking for larval muskies in these areas. So that just adds to our evidence that um, successful reproduction is likely very, very minimal. And those two larval muskies actually came from the Menominee River. So um, again, highly unlikely that there's much successful natural reproduction going on in there. Um, some other key take home points from that research. Um, they identified that muskies were spawning in major tributaries, in particular the Fox River. They had six fish that they implanted radio tags or acoustic tags in that we knew their stocking locations because those fish were pit tagged at the time of stocking. And all but one of those muskies returned to their stocking location to spawn. So it's a small sample size, but five of the six muskies with a known stocking location returned to those stocking locations to spawn. And they also saw moderate levels of spawning site fidelity across years. So fish would return to the same areas to spawn year after year after year. So starting to kind of piece things together that there's at least some sort of semblance of those muskies returning to a stocking location to spawn and they're returning to the same areas to spawn year after year. So perhaps stocking location is highly important for a restoration program. What other pieces of information do we have that start to show some spawning site fidelity in these fish? So like I said, we've been doing annual spring netting surveys on the Fox River for um, quite a while. And between 2021 and 2022, we had 29 fish that were recaptured in those surveys that had pit tags implanted either in previous year's surveys or at the time of stocking. And 27 of those fish were either pit tagged at the time of stocking and stocked in the Fox River or were tagged as adults in the Fox River. So again, the vast majority of the fish that we're handling were stocked in the Fox River or were tagged as adults, so returning to the same areas. Um, one of those fish was actually tagged when it was stocked in Lake Butamore up in the Winnebago system, so it was couldn't get back into its original stocking location, and the 29th fish was tagged in Dead Horse Bay, so just outside of the Fox River. So again, some pretty strong evidence of moderate to high levels of um, spawning site fidelity and returning to your stock locations to spawn. We also have the Peshtigo pit tag um, array that I had talked about. In between 2021 and 2022, um, we recorded 55 different muskies that had pit tags in them. Um, so we can whittle that down to the spawning season and look at what fish were around there in May during the peak of the spawn because that array records the date and time that they crossed that array and it's up near the dam where it's thought that muskies um, could potentially spawn and that's where we stock them. So we can look at spawning runs and what fish are in and around the Peshtigo River during the spawning time of those. So 49 of those 55 fish, so about 90%, were pit tagged at the time of stocking um, and they were stocked in the Peshtigo River. So again, the vast majority of the fish that we're detecting on our pit tag array in the Peshtigo River were fish that were stocked in the Peshtigo River. So um, stocking location matters if we're trying to create a restoration program, we should be, and they're returning to their stocking locations to spawn, we should be stocking these fish in areas with the best spawning and nursery habitat. We shouldn't be stocking them in areas with really poor habitat. Um, so 
how does this play in where we've historically been stocking fish? Um, so the vast majority of the fish that we've stocked have been stocked in the Fox River and the Menominee River. So almost 72% of the fingerlings and almost 60% of the yearlings have been stocked in these two locations. Um, if we boil that down to just the Fox River, um, where according to the UWSP research, there's only about 1% of the river is suitable spawning habitat, and there's really no wetlands in there, so there's really little nursery habitat. Um, we've stocked 54% of the fingerlings and about a third of the yearlings. So we've put a lot of effort into stocking this system, and if they're coming back here to spawn, they're not going to be have a very good chance at getting successful natural reproduction in a system like the Fox River given current environmental conditions. Um, just want to highlight that we have, uh, we also are stocking six other locations, the Peshtigo River, Oconto River, Pensaki River, Suamico River on the west shore, and Little Sturgeon Bay and Sturgeon Bay on the east shore. But again, these have received much lower numbers of fish through time. So, how have we used this information? Um, the first thing that we've done is identified four new stocking locations for muskies, and those are Dead Horse Bay and Point Sable and Southern Green Bay, the two um, stars in Southern Bay, as well as Seagull Bar area near the mouth of the Menominee River, as well as Egg Harbor. So all of these areas are thought to have much better water quality or high uh, quality wetland habitat that would be much better suited for musky spawning and nursery habitat compared to places like the Fox River. We're still going to stock all of our historical locations, but what we're doing is taking a lot of the fish that we had been putting in the Fox and Menominee Rivers and putting those into some of these other locations that are thought to have better spawning habitat. We're also going to increase the numbers of fish that we're stocking in the Sturgeon Bay and Little Sturgeon Bay area. Both of these areas have higher water quality than a place like the Fox River as well as high quality um, wetlands. So hopefully altering our stocking locations could help, um, but we're going to monitor that. Um, so with both research projects as well as our surveys. So what are we doing for um, additional surveys in the future? Um, the first thing that we're gonna do as an agency is survey more um, locations in the spring for adult muskies. So we put a lot of effort into the Fox River, some effort into the Menominee River, but we put very little targeted muskie surveys into areas like Little Sturgeon Bay, Sturgeon Bay, and the Peshtigo River, yet these have been stocked for quite some time, and we don't have a lot of data on what the current adult population is like in these areas. We're also going to try to expand some of our fall young of the year electrofishing surveys into some of these habitats that are thought to have better spawning and nursery habitat like Sturgeon Bay and Little Sturgeon Bay to try to get a better handle on if there is more natural reproduction going on in these areas and we're just not documenting it because we're not surveying these areas. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, Lower Green Bay and the Fox River is a designated area of concern. It's hard to see, but there's a red line that outlines the area of concern in the bay itself. It runs from Point Sabo across to Longtail Point and everything south of that, as well as the Fox River up to the De Pere Dam. And I talked about a remedial action plan to um, reverse some of those impacts that we've had. So currently there's 12 areas that are designated for habitat restoration projects throughout um, this larger AOC area. Six of those uh, habitat restoration projects have muskies as a target species. And so when we're picking our, or when we're trying to decide what the habitat restoration is gonna look like, it's based on the species of interest for that particular habitat. So six of these, um, are going to get um, enhanced, hopefully enhanced musky spawning habitat, and we're going to use um, the, the uh, habitat variables from the UWSP research to try and design um, habitat features that we know muskies are keying in on for laying their eggs, as well as work to establish um, a lot of the wetlands that we've lost throughout this area that serves as critical musky spawning and nursery habitat. And so um, that's all I'm going to say about the AOC because Bree Kupski, our AOC program coordinator, will be doing
doing one of these fishery spotlight series in about a month on March 4th, and she can provide a lot more details. But um, we are working to try to enhance musky spawning and nursery habitat in Lower Green Bay and the Fox River. Um, UWSP also has secured some grants to continue to expand on their research for evaluating natural reproduction. So they have a graduate student that's going to be out starting this coming spring um, that's going to be doing additional egg and larval sampling for muskies and um, looking for areas outside of the Fox River and Menominee River um, that we thought would have good spawning and nursery habitat. So some of the coastal marsh and coastal wetland habitat along the west shore of Green Bay, up into the Sturgeon Bay and Little Sturgeon Bay area. So really trying to see what is musky egg deposition like in some of these other areas and are muskies actually successfully hatching in some of these areas and if they are, what habitat features are resulting in that successful reproduction. They're also going to be implanting acoustic tags in adult muskies that spawn in the Sturgeon Bay area. Um, we don't know a lot about where adults that spawn in the Sturgeon Bay area move to throughout the rest of the year. Do they stay in the Sturgeon Bay area or do they move out into Green Bay proper and down into Southern Green Bay and contribute to the rest of the Green Bay fishery? Um, we also are hoping to pit tag more stocked fish in the future. Um, pit tags are critical for understanding a lot of the concepts that I've already talked about, but they can also be used to really give us a good idea about how do we maximize the survival of our stocked fish by looking at things like um, size at the uh, time of stocking as well as locations um, and environmental conditions at the time of stocking. And then looking at what fish we recapture as adults to really see if it's, you know, only fish certain size and larger seem to be surviving or if survival seems to be higher in certain areas so that we can really uh, maximize the, uh, the bang for the buck that we're getting out of our stocked fish. Um, and also understand how these stocked fish contribute to the adult populations. So I think that is it. So hopefully work to really get a grasp on the musky spawn. So what do we have time for questions? Yeah. I'll do a quick one from the chat. Yeah. Hey, Jason, this is, should be an easy one. Um, they're asking which fins are clipped on the muskies that are stopped. So the fingerlings all get left pelvic fin clips and the yearlings all get right pelvic fin clips. Yes, pelvic fin clips, ventral clips. So left or right? Left or right, yes. Yep. How big is the yearling? Is that one in the picture in that pan mint? Um, so the yearlings typically range in size from 13 to 18 inches. They can get to be really big in some years. Do you have Yes, yeah, um, traditionally we're looking for about a 14 inch yearling uh, going out the door. The years that we did get like 16 to 18 inch were years, because we traditionally would stock the fish in June. So they're a full year old. Years that we knew we were not getting fish from Michigan due to, you know, VHS flare up in the spawning grounds or whatever, we didn't have to get rid of the fish as quickly. So we, could hang, we knew we weren't getting a following year class, so then we would hang on to them until September and put additional size on them. Uh, the advantage was, one, they got bigger, and two, you guys know what the bay is like in June? That was never real conducive for the fish. We had to get them out, so we tried to stock them as soon as we could in June, um, but it, it was never good water quality and water temperatures. They would get really stressed up. So um, the years that we knew going in that we weren't going to have additional fish for the following year, we just op maximized the growth on the fish that we had. I got a question. Yep. This past fall, I was on the river, I caught like a seven inch muskie. Would that have been natural reproduced? Uh, I mean, last year, we caught eight of them behind my shop in the O'Connell River. Uh, 48, 42, and the rest of them are like around 24 to 27. So it's it's hard to say if it was naturally reproduced. We did stock some yearlings out, but that would be on the awful small end of a yearling 
Um, you know, there, there's a range of sizes for those fish. Um, you know, the Otonto is one of the areas that we're considering for natural reproduction. It's just leaving the water open. Yeah, there and there's some, some wetlands in the river itself and some vegetation as well as the big complex of wetlands at the mouth. So it's definitely potential that it could have been a naturally reproduced fish. I think it was one or two fish that were likely naturally reproduced were also caught in the Menominee River because they were you know, like six inches long before we had stocked any for that particular year that they caught them on the Menominee. So it's possible. Yep, might be kind of a dumb question, but is there like a voluntary like creel survey that like we can take or like an app or anything like that? Or have we thought about that many at all? Or, like so we are considering different ways to overhaul our creel program. As far as muskies go, either or. Yeah, we well, um, we're really interested in muskies, especially if you're willing to buy a pit tag reader and are willing to scan fish. Um, a lot of the <coughs> Tidal Town muskie guys, some of the guides are starting to get pit tag readers um, and scan fish as well, because that really helps us get more. Um, recaptures to evaluate survival it can help us understand movements and things like that but we'll give you the whole history of any fish that you scan if you have a pit tag reader and you can get pit tag readers for relatively cheap i guess a hundred bucks you can get one that does a, a decent job at reading the tags and things and so um we're definitely open for that we are looking at ways to improve our creel program with angler surveys and other things as a whole to try and get better data so are you looking at the cost question the question is uh what is the cost for raising a fingerling versus a yearling muskie so i think our fish culture folks in the room are going to have to ask answer that um it, it is substantially higher to get to the size um it's and Going forward in future years, it's going to cost even more because our, our one of the things that we're really running into is forage prices. You know, you guys go up fishing and you know what minnows go up to at the bait shop. Try buying you know ten thousand pounds of them at a crack. That's that the, the forage cost has gone up astronomically the past few years. So we're trying to get a grip on trying to figure out what it's costing us to raise fish in the hatchery system for fish. And then project that forward, where you know we start getting annual increases of you know, 15 to 20 percent in forage. How much more that's going to impact that? Um, as far as coming up with a specific, specific price, price, I don't know. Right. Uh, the question about uh, looking at other, other areas of stocking. So. Um, yeah, we have put a lot of effort into evaluating the Fox and the Menominee River uh, because that's where most of our fish have been stocked. Um, we do plan on targeting other areas like the Peshtigo, um, Sturgeon Bay, Little Sturgeon Bay with adult surveys as well as young of the year surveys. Um, you know, and potentially look at other options like the Ocano if we have staff and time to get into some of these other locations and then as we start stocking these new locations, we'll be incorporating those into surveys in like five to seven years once the fish that we're stocking now should get to be large enough to actually spawn to look at what they're doing in those areas. And then if the NUR is awarded, will this have any impact? Um, I'm not sure if there'll be any opportunities to expand research or not. Um, you know, we'll have to see how they choose to prioritize research with regards to the NUR, but um, a lot of our areas that we stock muskies are going to be included in the um, in the areas where the NUR has been designated, which for those who don't know what the NUR is, it's a, a green bay and UWGB is leading this, is up for consideration of a national estuarine research reserve. Um, I think, but they, um, you know, there would be potential for more research and things if it gets designated. But UWGB, University of Wisconsin, Green Bay is leading this, um, the effort to designate it as a nurse. So we'll see. Yep. Uh, you said that there's software data used to determine the uh, amount of viable spawning areas on the Menominee and the Fox. Is that, is that hard? 
you know, software used, like could you use it other areas very efficiently on the way to kind of figure out good areas of spot and habitat? Uh, yeah, I mean, potentially they're able to, I mean, it's mapping, sonar mapping habitat. So they were driving along near shore shallow water areas and then looking for areas that had the gravel type habitat and things. So yeah, it definitely could be quite an undertaking to try and map the entire bay, but you could, you know, pick and choose certain areas that you think really have good habitat. So, and I'm not, I'm not sure if um, UWSP is going to incorporate mapping into this round of um, their habitat sampling to map the potential available habitat or just more key in on the exact, you know, the characteristics, the habitat features of where they're actually depositing eggs and hopefully naturally reproducing. So it would be up to them to make the final call on that. There was a question on population estimates, if we have those for muskie. We don't. Um, you know, if, if we get enough mark recapture data, maybe someday we could get for like a local spawning population, but that takes intensive sampling and a lot of mark and recapture data to try and get those estimates, but we don't have those right now. How many of you want us to do this again next year? Oh, okay. I guess we're gonna have to do it next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is really good. Uh, I think I've seen up to 80 people online. So plus the 50 we have here. So, you know, well over a hundred people in a, in a meeting, uh, which is really good. Uh, a lot of great information that, that Jason has shared. Um, I put it in a chat as well, and we have a, a sheet here. Uh, we're working on developing a Green Bay Gov delivery list so that uh, if we have fish management updates with kind of information you saw tonight, uh, we can send that out to you and you can get that information that way as well. So uh, if you want to sign up for it, make sure you in the room get signed up here in the chat. Um, you know, throw Jason or me an email. Uh, asking to get added to the list and, and we'll get a, a spreadsheet together uh, for that. Jesse? And are you, did you guys record tonight? We did not. We did not, okay. Um, just wondering if the PowerPoint was my question. We can we can PDF it and email it. Yep. I'm recording it. Yep. Yes. Uh I do five to ten presentations a year at school groups. Some I just do PowerPoint presentations, others will bring our electro fishing boat and nets and set them up in a parking lot and let the students actually see it all firsthand. Um, so we do do these. Like uh, UWGD's uh, rolling out weed green bay for both boys and girls, and you have access right down to that. Maybe there would be some chance yep. at that level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've we've gone so far as uh, Aldo Leopold School does a week long conservation course thing for students. Uh, and it's right on the Fox River and we'll put our electric fishing boat in the Fox River and let them watch a shock and bring fish up and do that. So if there would be opportunities at UWGB, we're all for it. Um, so. And I do have a stack of business cards I put on the corner over by the sink there for, um, I've got my email and phone numbers up here, but it's also, you can grab one of those on the way out. Um, as well, they have contact, my contact information for questions or for school groups, any opportunities. Yeah. Is there anything else we can do to help uh, the DNR with their efforts as individuals or conservation organizations? Um, the, the support that you're providing has been incredibly helpful, so continue to help us with that. You know, matching funds for grants and things, um, help us with capturing data on pit tag recaptures. I know your club has pit tag readers and if you're willing to purchase more, um, we're gonna, I think, get your club up and rolling with tagging fish some individuals this year that don't have tags. So that'll help us get more tags out there, but just 
you know, be involved when Reese, when the Dan, I call him the dance, Dan Eiserman and Dan Demkowski reach out for where are you guys seeing muskie spawn to help us out, um, yeah. help them out with those locations to help us understand the spawning ecology better. So those are all good ways um, to be involved. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Drive home safe and thanks for coming.